This is Daniel Fox. Uh, I'm back for our last, our third video to review Mangosh, a chaos supplement for Zweihander RPG, which you can see right here, this book right here. We're in our third third part, um, final part for that matter, uh, as we go through Mangosh. Uh, of course, I've been flipping through the books. Um, I went through pretty much the first two thirds and we're on page 223 right now. And where we last left off, we were looking at Liber Malice. This chapter is meant for game masters to be able to create their own creatures using the same rules that I used to create every single creature from Zweihander, all 121, I believe is what it is. So I basically took the rules that I used uh, in this book, this book here, and if you recall, for those of you who own Zweihander, you know that there's a massive section, it's a full-on beast hearing, that runs from page 459 to 613, a full beast hearing. And I've taken all the rules I use to create creatures and put them here in Mongosh. And the reason for that is you know, twofold. One, I believe utility is more important than addition. So, in, and what I mean by that is it's more important for us as a company to give you the tools to create your own stuff than simply to create more books just to make more money. I'd rather teach you how to make your own stuff, how to, as a game master, how to create your own creatures and create your own beast areas. And although we do intend to release some really cool thematic beast areas over time, it felt necessary, especially in Mongosh, to teach you as a game master how to create creatures. So, Lear Malice is actually split in two parts. It starts first with the creature creator, and then it dives into the NPC creator, which we're going to go into as well. But we're going to start first with creatures. So, anytime you make a creature in Zweihander or using Mongosh, you figure out what your what influenced you to make it. Um, you know, in this case, we included what's the the, the demo dog, which is from uh, Stranger Things and influenced by Cujo as well and Hellhounds. Um, that was the influence with the sample creature we create here in Mongosh. But you're going to pick classification, you're going to write down influences. So you can see we're actually going to build it along the way using a sheet that you'll find further back in the book. We're going to build it through here as we teach you how to create creatures. You decide on the creature size, and the creature size will determine how many fury dice it gets. For instance, small creatures do not add any fury dice to damage. Normal creatures add 1d6 fury dice, just like, you know, in all player ancestry is most creatures throughout the book. Large creatures utilize 2d6 fury die to modify attack damage, and huge creatures use 3d6. So when you look at, back in Zweihander, when you look at the, the, the pit dragon as an example, you're like, oh my gosh, this thing only does 18 damage? How is it even remotely quote real well the reality is is if you look in the game master section it talks about like how larger creatures it's kind of up to you to define that how many dice they're gonna do how big they are it's up to you and then here we're gonna do the same thing we're gonna teach you how to select those sizes and assign it so we're saying here a demo dog is actually large so it'll do 2d6 fear dice for damage including whatever else it uses to modify it then you choose this risk factor risk factors in notch are incredibly important because it determines how many how many uh, abilities or traits or modifiers it will receive. And we'll walk through it as we kind of go through this. So now it's a risk factor, intermediate, medium, our demo dog. Then you go to your primary attributes. And we kind of know what these already are, but they're kind of presented in a remedial fashion just in case. Just in case you want them all in hand as you're kind of going through and creating your own creatures. So you'll go through and you'll select one of two arrays. You're basically going to assign these values, 50, 45, 45, 40, 40, 40, 40 and 35. Coincidentally, these are the same values that are assigned to all of the beasts, all of the creatures inside Zweihander, inside the bestiary. So you're using the same math that I use to create monsters uh, in the book. So as before, we're going through our sheet, kind of putting all of our numbers in, and we come to roll. So. Rolls are defined in four ways. So normal creatures just don't have any additional modifiers. Underlings 
are kind of like henchmen, I guess you could say. They get killed much easier. So you know, if you select to make a creature a hench, an underling, it, they don't bank APs, they can't use misfortune points, and they're slain if they're made to bleed or suffer an injury. Meaning you kind of can, players can kind of cut through them very easily. Um, for those who want more of a dungeon grind style experience for their Zwei Hunter game, making them underlings helps. And of course we talk about how to turn them into magicians. So how to increase incantation, uh, where to reassign stats, how many spell ranks they should have, you know, what reagents they need, if they invoke cast manifestations or not. And of course, you're seeing all these beautiful pieces of artwork by Dan Mandich throughout this entire work. But we also provide ways for you to randomize spells because sometimes there's just so many spells across all these books. I mean, how would you possibly know? Even myself, and I've, you know, I've wrote Zweihander. Uh, in Mongosh. I couldn't tell you every single effect of every single spell, so we've got these random tables for you to utilize across all Arcana. Right? Across all Arcana. Across all prayers, so divine magic. And then covenant magic. So you could technically cr custom create all of your own custom-made spell list utilizing this approach. This very, very simple approach. And then we talk about bosses, because bosses adjust their notch. They have higher primary attributes depending on their tier, and you reflect that down below. So then we move to skill ranks. So skill ranks, uh, obviously I mentioned before, their risk factor and notch determines how many, up to how many skill ranks you can select when you create this creature. So in the case, uh, you know, and you can see all your different skills. I mean, this is all pretty straightforward. Like all these skills pretty much make sense. You know exactly what we're going for here. You've seen this before. And the same thing with bonus advances. Bonus advances, meaning increasing primary attribute bonuses, is determined, once again, unsurprisingly, by the risk factor and the notch. And that continues on we're kind of teaching you how to assign, how not to assign too much. You know, you can see you marked them here in our little example. And of course, we have our example text up here. And then you start to assign traits. In traits, as I mentioned before, much like skill ranks, much like primary attribute bonuses, you assign traits based on their risk factor and notch. This is probably sounding pretty remedial at this point because that is what determines how many traits you split up. And every single creature in Zweihander, every single one, is built in this way, built in this exact same fashion, made within the same mathematical formulas including distribution of the primary attributes, bonuses, skill ranks, traits, everything in Zweihander, as it's defined, uses this same approach, this exact same approach in, in Mongosh. So we have all of your risk factor traits separated by risk factors. So if something is a basic risk factor, you can go through and select these. And it has little what it does beside it. We have intermediate risk factor traits, of course. It continues on and on and on. Because there's a lot of traits. There's a lot of traits to, to know. Um, so you can kind of pick and choose what you think fits the vision of the creature you're creating. And advanced risk factor traits. And technically, anything that's elite risk factor that has a unique notch can use any of these. And we include a table in the appendix to put them together as opposed to repeating the same stuff in the same chapter because we don't want to bulk it up. But um, nonetheless, we're kind of going back to our demo dog. We decided it has Dark Sins, a foul mutation, it has Gutter Runner, Fanged Maw, Barbed Spines, Ripping Teeth, Natural Armor, and Masterfully Adroit. And then you begin to conjugate its attack profile, whether it uses traditional or natural weapons. And if it uses natural weapons, based on its risk factor, we'll determine how many natural weapons it has. And then based on its classification, like if it's abyssal, or an animal, or a humanoid, or a mutant, or a beast. You can actually choose these different types of natural weapons to plug in when you create your creature. You custom create your creature using Mongosh. And of course, you can feel free to get creative. In fact, it tells you right here, like, you wanna craft your own natural weapons? Cool, choose one to three qualities and make it really interesting. And here's how you can do so, just by using all of the quality, weapon qualities that exist right now in the game. You create some really interesting, you know, custom, bespoke, natural weapons of your choice. And of course, we can see here that we've assigned our demo dog the lower demonic claws and halitosis bite. 
We haven't conjugated this damage yet because we're not quite there. We haven't put it, there's no load, it's completely engaged. But as you look over here, here's our completed demo dog. There's no spells. It's abyssal. It's influenced by Stranger Things, Hellhounds, and Cujo. It's large, so it does, you know, that much damage. And it shows, you know, basically this whole sheet is blank in the back for you to copy, photocopy, and, and create your own. And we have it on the Grim and Perilous Library, so you can create your own stuff. So that is essentially how you create creatures in Mongosh. How you can create creatures using this Voihander method, uh, using this book by page 239. So then we move on to non-player characters. And, and non-player characters are always kind of unique because the, qu the question I always run into is like, what is absolutely necessary for purposes of role play? And then what is necessary for role play and for game stats? And we take, we basically teach you two different approaches. Uh, we show you a simple approach, which is basically creating narrative descriptors that'll have some mechanical effect. And then we have complex ones where you create an entire array of attributes and you create NPCs that are very, very kind of complex, but with five NPC, but for the simple method, we call it the five sentence NPC. And within our example, we're creating Solomon Cain. He's a, and we do it like in a Mad Lib style. A dour English period and a redresser of wrongs. He's an adult human male. He's a tall height, slender build with pale skin. This basically tells you pretty much everything that you need as a game master uh, to to run Solomon Cain in this case uh, in, uh, in, 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 in World for Roleplaying. And of course, you develop your persona and your identity. That's where you select your, you know, how you're identified. A little bit about the background of your character, their name and their sex, their pronouns, et cetera, et cetera. And we include some kind of random names in here too for you to use. And there, there, you know, there's a hundred male names and a hundred female names. You can mix and match these as you wish. Obviously, you don't have to necessarily be a man to have a male name or a woman to have a female name or everything else in between. You don't have to identify anyhow. You just select a name if you want. And it's a total random table. It's entirely up to you how do you want to use that. Um, but for our our actual example of the book, we're actually going to build Danziger Eckhart, our misfortunate protagonist at the beginning of both Zweihander and Mongosh, including uh, the inspirations. He's inspired by the band Danzig, the term edgelord that seems to fit the tongue-in-cheek jokish nature of Zweihander and, and dark fantasy games in general. So we kind of build him out. We build him out completely using these rules, and we teach you about, you know, begin to fill in all these blank spaces, choosing your, your age group, we go into your ancestries you can choose. We have your appearance and social class and complexion and manner of dress and height type. Instead of using specific heights and specific weights, we decide to make it a little simpler to say, are they short, normal, or tall? Because as you'll see, once we move a little further on, including their manner of dress, this is only the things that are important. You'll see how this all kind of comes together. But we have all the distinguishing marks in here. What their social class means, and most of this is pretty much remedial. You know most of this already as a game master. But you can see, it says, Denziger Eckhart is an adult human male. He is of tall stature and a husky build for a human, but with dark tan skin. He's dressed shabbily for someone of the lowborn class and has burn scars on his face and arms. He's of the uh, warrior archetype. His revelation is, which you'll find out here in just a few moments. But very, very simple spoken in very simple sentences, five sentence, five sentences to basically talk about the simple approach. And you'll see this kind of goes on for quite some time. It teaches you once again how to build everything. He is of the warrior archetype driven by revelation and is a chaos aligned. So that's, that's poor Danziger. But if you want to get really distinct, you can start putting in primary attributes based on their archetype. And you can create your own custom custom NPCs using this method. So basically this teaches you how to quickly create a complex character because NPCs are built the same way characters are, at least they utilize the same math, but this is kind of expedited in a way that is very quick for you to make distributions, including how you split distributions of, of skills by archetype. And you'll see that kind of goes on, including bonus advances. And much like how in creatures were created, your risk factor and your notch determines how many bonus advances you get how many talents you select, how many traits they get, what talents may belong to which archetypes. And of course, this is very fluid. Nothing is necessarily hard and fast. You can flex these as needed. Meaning you don't necessarily have to, like as an example, we say light sleeper typically belongs to a commoner and a ranger and a warrior, but you could be a socialite or a knave or an academic and have light sleeper. You could absolutely make that, that, that exception because talents are not 
balanced against one another. They're instead they're balanced against the bounded accuracy model of Zweihander of the powered by the, the powered by Zweihander D100 game engine. So we use this merely as kind of a, a tool or a map for you, but you could feel free to change it as necessary. Of course, we talk about additional options like selecting professional traits and archetype and ancestral traits and wrapping it up with trappings and how much cash they have and any final considerations you would need to make for the approach. And then here you have it. Here is Danziger Eckhart that we've created completely from the ground up using the simple method and the complex method carried through, including trappings, traits, talents, all that fun stuff. It is a portrait. And this, by the way, this sheet is in the back of the book. It's the back of Mangosh. Well, this is a cool image. This is one of my other favorite images that Dan Mandich did. Uh, this is actually a reprisal of a previous image. Well, the very first image is he did actually for Zweihander was an image similar to this. And I had him redo it. And it's amazing to see how much his artwork has changed over the years. Having worked with the gentleman for over seven years, his artwork just continues to get better and better and better and better. And this really is kind of like, you know, one of these better pieces I feel. But this is Liber Obscurus or uh, the Book of Mysteries. Because in this, we're going to teach you how, as a game master, how to craft a conspiracy. Basically, how you create hooks, how you create the agendas of the conspiracy, how many clues you seed, how many leads, uh, how many clues lead come to a lead. The reasons why not to have people roll skill tests to find clues. Don't have people roll skill tests to find clues because they're going to find them regardless. Have them roll skill tests to understand them if they can't piece them together. Gum the gumshoe system is really good about this. The gumshoe system is a fantastic game of investigation and it kind of proposes the same thing and we kind of follow that within here too and in fact we take this conspiracy chapter and we'll overlay it in the adventure in the back against some, something about marie but the rule is basically three three and three so three clues generates a lead three leads once you get all that comes to a revelation and three revelations un, unfolds the conspiracy but you can actually tell you how to define leads, how to create leads, how to reveal them, what are important leads to use, where to kind of get out of dead ends when things aren't going quickly, how to quickly juice up the investigation with enforcers, how to use deus ex machina, but only sparingly, how to use adrenaline boost to basically make the game a little bit more exciting in the middle of these investigations. And then it talks about revelations, like why these are important, why relations lead to the conspiracy, because three relations should expose the entire conspiracy. And the question we get a lot is like, well, is this across one adventure? And the answer is, it's up to you. You could use you could use a whole conspiracy scenario against one adventure, or, or the conspiracy rules, or you could use it across an entire campaign. Um, as an example, we're using conspiracy rules right now in Queen of Embers. Here's some more beautiful artwork. And, and obviously, you need to dive in and really read about this, but I try to provide it in a very, very, very simple way for you to understand how to craft conspiracies using, using these rules. Now we come to the really cool adventure in the back. There's something about Marie. And this is another beautiful illustration done by Dan Mandich, as all artwork is done in Mongo Shans by Dan Mandich. Um, so I'm not going to give any spoilers, but I will tell you this. This adventure was originally written by Sammy Ute Sidolo, and... I approached him probably about two or three years ago because we had ran this adventure in part. In part, I said, "Hey, I really want to adapt this to Zweihander. Can I? Can I do it?" And he's like, "Yeah, sure." So we recrafted the story from the ground up, provided a more background and story about the the, the conspiracy, the plot synopsis, um, and has some cool artwork in there. But I don't want to spend too much time giving you spoilery stuff. But I will tell you this: um, it has some ties to a bitter harvest from. Zweihander, um, and some really interesting things that unfold in the story. And like I said, I don't want to give you any spoilers. I'm going to continue past. Um, I don't want, but 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 I do want to call something else out, though. Look at these beautiful maps. These were done by Peter Latibor of Garblog Games. Um, he, of course, is a longtime Zweihander fan, um, Warhammer fan as well. And they've been running Zweihander and Warhammer for quite some time. They ran this adventure. There's something about Marie about during our Kickstarter last year, which you can find on YouTube. We're going to rerun it again ourselves to show it in its current form. But uh, he did these really cool maps for it. 
um, up to and including the final showdown map here at the Toll House. But we're going to pass that. I don't want to give you any sort of spoilers as to what really happens in this. And frankly, I should probably just flip past for a moment. But we'll go direct to the appendix. Don't pay attention to this. This is, this is part of the spoiler over here. Um, <laughs> here's the appendix. And this image uh, was originally conscripted by Nordnerd.d. Um, and, and we had their permission to use it in this. So we made some changes and put it in. It's pretty cool. This is where our appendix begins. And the most important thing, I think, in the appendix is really the Taints of Chaos. Now, in Zweihander, we actually have Taints of Chaos. Like there's, there's, there's quite a few taints of chaos, but we don't really go into the depth about like what is different about each. We just kind of show, you know, here's a taint in a town, here's a taint in a table, and here's the effect. Instead, we kind of give some descriptors, some effects, and a few unique ways you can realize these different taints of chaos or mutations, like burning body. You know, what color is their flames? You know, like here's some different colors. What, what kind of head do you have? You have a chitinous head. You know, like a uh, crown of flesh. What does the crown look like? Baby hands? Does it look like... Eyes of various animals? Does it look like tails of animals? Tongues of blue, red, and black? Genitals of various girth? Like, there's all these different ways you can kind of look at Taints of Chaos, and there's all these neat kind of subtables within it for you to use to create your own kind of vision of the type of, of mutations your character may have. And there's 100 of those. So, and then we have a, a, a risk factor and size of creature kind of appendix in here from Zweihander now carried forward in this that you can use as a reference. We also have all the creature traits divided by risk factor, basic, intermediate, advanced, elite, and whatnot in the effects. So kind of a repeat of before, but all in one concise place for you to reference always, always, always when you need it at the table. Another really cool piece of artwork from Dan Mandich right here. And then of course our blank sheets for creature profiles, NPC profiles, and uh, then a very brief index because there's not, there's not, there's a lot of stuff in Mongosh, but it didn't really require a heavy duty index. And of course our in sheet, which is, you know, go buy Spy Hunter too, please. So that that brings us to the end of, of Mongosh. Um, this has been an interesting uh, uh, way, I think, of looking at the book without having the PDF in front of us, because I really wanted to show off the make and the quality of material and really kind of show you what it's like to flip through these these beautiful, beautiful books. And they're, they're soft touch covers. So if you're familiar with the Descent of Avernus or any of the D&D limited edition books, we use that as our basic material. Like everything is soft touch cover. We don't use glossy covers. We use the highest grade materials we possibly can, including smithe binding and ribbons and colored end papers, just like the collector's edition qualities of D&D has as our standard material, because we want to distinguish ourselves by having some of the best material and the least expensive books in the industry. Because we know with our connections through Andrews of Meal Publishing, who've been in the publishing world for decades, that you know, we've got really good printers that are trustworthy. We've worked with for many, many years, and we have many different choices and types of material we can use, and we always choose the best, but I always feel that the soft touch cover is always the best way to approach having a book, because it's easier to carry, easier to hold, and it just feels nice. It's kind of velvety and soft, and feels a little bit, not, not rubbery by any means, but it is softer, and it really makes the images pop. Like, this cover image by Ken Duquette is just so amazing. So... Um, thank you all. Seriously, thank you all for tuning in and watching this. Um, I know this is a little longer than you probably expected. Three videos over, you know, three, almost three hours to look at Mongosh. But I really wanted to show off everything that, that was there to really show you why it's worth purchasing and, 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 and why you should go out and buy it. Um, it's a cool book, um, if I must say so myself. Of course, I'm you know, I'm, I'm a bit, uh, you know, I, I, it's my book, <laughs> but, um, but it is a really cool book. Um, it comes at 360 pages. It's super beefy. It's $55, uh, on at retail. Amazon has it right now for 38. If you get it quick, if you buy the physical book on Amazon, drop me and drop me a message in our discord, uh, because I will give you the PDF for free. If you buy the physical book. Um, unfortunately, I can't give you a discount on the physical book if you buy the PDF first. So go buy the book from your friendly local gaming store or Amazon or Barnes & Noble or Walmart or Target or Books A Million or Indigo Canada or wherever your favorite bookstore is. Buy it. Drop us a message in Discord. I will send you the PDF within 24 hours so you have it for your, for your device on the go. 
Um, but but seriously, you know, Mongoosh is a, is a really cool product, um, and it opens up a whole new realm of chaos for Zweihander, and I think you're really going to enjoy it. So thank you once again for watching this video, and uh, I will see you again soon, probably on our Twitch partner channel, and we'll do a similar video toward no late November, early December for the Player's Handbook, which I am super, super stoked to show you all. Um, I don't have it yet. I wish I did, or else I'd give you a sneak peek. Um, but uh, for now, um, we'll talk again soon, and happy gaming. Cheers.